All right. Well, I see a few people. I'm going to minimize you all so you're not distracting me while I'm talking. Um, but uh, I want to welcome you all to our History Sandwiched In program. So today I'm both our introducer and our presenter, which is always a bit awkward for me, but I'm going to try my two hats and Carrie will be maintaining the technology end of things. So for today, I am delving a little bit into the early history of agriculture in the Finger Lakes region. Um, somewhat focused on Geneva, but really it's a broader story than just Geneva. It covers um, both Geneva, the Finger Lakes region, and some elements of the story are true for most of uh, the Northeastern United States to one degree or another. So um, I've started off with a, a woodcut that we'll get a little bit more into, but the story of early American agriculture, including that in Western New York, is the story of land and labor. These two components of farming shaped production choices and methods throughout the colonies and later the states. In the South, they drove the expansion of slavery. Of course, shortage of labor was part of the reason for the expansion of slavery. The expansion of the nation, uh, the movement West also uh, led to the conflict over the expansion of slavery. In the North, these two things shaped industrialization and immigration, again, due to labor shortages. Although agriculture developed nationally, as we will see, many of the shifts can be seen in the microcosm in New York State, in microcosm in New York State and the Finger Lakes. Much of the Finger Lakes region is ideally suited to agricultural production. This was well known to the indigenous people who cultivated corn, beans, and squash on the land. And so uh, if you want more on Haudenosaunee agriculture, the indigenous people often also called the Iroquois, uh, go back to our website and watch John's presentation from last month's History Sandwiched In because he delved into their form of agriculture uh, quite a bit. So I'm not going to go too much into that today. They had apple and peach orchards on the shores of Seneca Lake as reported by the soldiers of the 1779 Sullivan Clinton campaign who were tasked with, with destroying them. And this is the map that shows you on that dark line, the path of Washington soldiers heading up here to destroy the power of the Iroquois, um, including right here by Geneva. And one of the things they noticed was the agricultural land, the soldiers who were tasked with that, that job. Um, the retreat of the glaciers at the end of the last ice age left behind deep valleys of the Finger Lakes and the fertile plain to the north. The soil, climate, and landforms of the Finger Lakes region make it some of the best farmland in New York State. And you can see here in this map, the green, the dark green is the, uh, and the yellow are the prime farmland. And you can see the dark green, including right here around Geneva, is uh, more than 75% prime farmland. And again, looking at the uh, relief map, you can see that this is the plain that was left behind after the retreat of the glaciers. And so again, some of the best farmland in New York state is along this path. And you can also see the natural transportation route that developed first with the canal, then the railroad, then of course the New York state throughway system. And then just a picture of the New York Finger Lakes region. So giving us an idea of the settings that many of us are familiar with. And of course, the map, uh, the map showing the Finger Lakes that we generally consider to be part of the Finger Lakes region. Today, I will be talking primarily about the area known as the Phelps and Gorham Purchase. After the revolution and the destruction of Iroquois or Haudenosaunee political power, the new United States had to settle the claims to territory put forth by several states, primarily New York and Massachusetts. Once rights were settled, enormous tracts of land were purchased by wealthy investors who wanted to sell it off at a profit. Much of the Finger Lakes region is in the Phelps and Gorham Purchase, including Geneva and Rochester. To the east, and I've got it marked here, this is Phelps and Gorham here. To the east is the military tract, which includes Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, most of Schuyler, Tompkins, and Cortland counties. This land was distributed to continental, continental soldiers by the federal government in payment for their services. To the west is the Holland land purchase and a number of other smaller uh, land purchases as well. And the Morris Reserve also. Land was also set aside for the nations of the Haudenosaunee. 
uh, but many of these lands were reduced or eliminated by state treaties in the early 1800s. And you can see this entire area here uh, was one of the reserves over here. This is the Oneida Reservation, uh, a good portion of the north end of Cayuga Lake. I don't have expertise in this, but I would guess that this is the root of most of the land claim issues that are being dealt with these days in the courts. And also the uh, Tonawanda, the Buffalo Reserves, most of these were reduced by the state um, who did not legally have the authority, as I understand it, to uh, resolve those treaties. And so that is why we continue to have issues with uh, the land claim today. <coughs> Excuse me. It is important to remember, and it is something that is often left out of the way that we tell history, uh, both in this region and nationally, that this did not mean that the native people were gone. They were still very much present here. Most of the early people coming through from the east, uh, Eastern colonies or former colonies and states to this region mention stopping at Indian villages and in, encountering uh, the Seneca, the Mohawk, and many of the different people um, who were still living here. Some were forced off uh, to Niagara Falls and Canada, but there were still many native people there at that time. And of course, continue to live here today, uh, part of our nation. So now we have the land rush. Uh, the quality of land was a selling point early in the history of non-native settlement. After the revolution, land speculators and their agents flooded into the region looking to buy land cheaply and turn it around for huge profits. The profits hinged on the land being attractive to potential settlers in New England and coastal communities. Perhaps the most influential of these men was Charles Williamson, agent for the Pulteney estate, the purchasers of the Phelps and Gorham lands. A true real estate agent, in 1798, he described the land to prospective immigrants in glowing terms and reported it was cheap but fertile. He said, and I quote, soil of the country has in every instance proved favorable to the raising of grain. The long and moderate summers seem particularly adapted to bring to perfection wheat, barley, and oats, end quote. Crops of hay, he wrote, were better than elsewhere in America. The land was good for raising cattle and suitable for dairy farms. Fish, fowl, and deer were abundant, and there were plenty of mills for sawing wood and grinding grain. The weather was never too hot to make butter, and winters were mild and short. While rivers in New York and Philadelphia froze, New York City, excuse me, the lakes and rivers of the Genesee country did not freeze and were navigable through winter. So we can see that that was a bit of an exaggeration, speaking as someone who's experienced a pretty uh, harsh winter this year, and I can't even imagine uh, such a winter without central heating. Uh, Williamson was exaggerating because he wanted to sell land as much as possible, and much of that came out of this pamphlet that he published and distributed uh, along the East Coast and even in Europe to people he thought would be wonderful people to settle the country, and he was the one who attracted the Rose and Nicholas families um, and a lot of settlers uh, from Maryland, I believe Carol and Fitzhugh, quite a few of the uh, slaveholders that came here came through Williamson, we believe, through Williamson's influence. He wanted the right sort of men to lead the country, and he felt that the people living in those communities were more educated, more refined, similar to him as an Englishman and upper class than perhaps the people that were most interested in moving out here. So then there was the way to get here, the roads west. And this gives us an idea of the different options that were available. Uh, this map uh, is from the um, Family Search website. So I did not put it together, but the main one that I'm interested in here is the Great Genesee Road, which is essentially the path of five and 20 today. And that came right through uh, Geneva and was the path that many people took to get here. Williamson and other developers built new roads, making it possible to travel from New York City to the Genesee country in about six weeks, the same amount of time it took to travel from England to New York City. He advised traveling by water to Albany and then overland to Geneva. The prospective settler, he wrote, could journey by wagon with two oxen and two horses at 20 miles per day, carrying 300 pounds of goods. <clears throat> if they wanted to move quickly, they should bring only bedding, clothes, and cooking materials. Articles of household furniture could be purchased in the Genesee country for less than the cost of transportation. According to the reminiscences of early settlers, it was not always so easy. 
Oftentimes, several men would travel to the area first, usually within a family group, purchase land and plant a crop that would be ready when they returned, hopefully. Then they would come back with their families, hoping the crop would sustain them until they grew another. Others would bring their entire family during the winter when the roads were frozen and travel was easier. There was apparently a lot of traffic in the winter time because of that. These migrants planned to travel to arrive in time to plant this plant in the spring and establish a food supply by winter. Some planted without even the means to plow the ground first. Others tried to bring enough food to survive until they were self-sufficient. These plans could be derailed by a poor harvest, illness and death, or poor luck. There were plenty of reports of parties of migrants running out of food on the way and arriving at Geneva or another settlement nearly starved. Some stayed for a while and then returned to the area that they came from. Others continued west for better prospects as new territory opened up. Although the region was often described as a wilderness, the Haudenosaunee had successfully hunted and farmed the region for hundreds of years. Their methods simply didn't reflect the settlers' ideas about successful cultivation. In fact, according to Williamson's account of the area, the earliest settlers wouldn't buy open land, which they thought to be barren. These were actually the lands formerly cultivated by the Haudenosaunee, lands which later proved to be very fertile and highly valuable. To migrants from the East, farm success meant a particular vision of prosperity as summarized by Alcana Watson after traveling through the region in 1791. And um, I'm just gonna read out the quote because I really think it's worth in trying to inhabit the mindset of the people who settled the nation and their ideas about agriculture, about the nation, and about what progress was and how they defined it. My mind involuntarily expanded in anticipating the period when the waters of this lake will be stripped of nature's livery and in its place, rook enclosures, pleasant villas, numerous flocks, herds, etc., and inhabited by a happy race of people enjoying the rich fruits of their own labors and the luxury of sweet liberty and independence approaching to a millennial state. Of course, reading that first sentence, it almost sounds like something an environmentalist would write in objection to uh, development or changes to the natural environment is quite different from what you would have seen at the turn of the 20th century when there was a movement to preserve natural places because we began to realize as Americans that we had gotten rid of many of them. Uh, but in the late 18th century and early 19th century, the ideal vision of particularly Anglo immigrants to this country and the descendants of the earliest Anglo immigrants was that the Christian religious people would tame the wilderness. Uh, civilized the savage, of course, was the types of terminology that they used at that time. And uh, that kind of incorporated settling the land and turning it into productive land. Um, wild land was not valued. It was not considered the point that God had given the earth to people. I think some of that is, is mixed in with these visions of developing and taming the so-called so wilderness. Watson's idea is visualized in four woodcuts from Orsamus Turner's 1849 Pioneer History of the Holland Purchase of Western New York. Over the series, the farmer gradually expands his cleared lands and buildings until the land is divided neatly into squares and only a lone tree from the original forest still stands. And you can see that tree is right here from all of the, uh, the beginning forest down to this tamed landscape. While romanticized, these images do reflect this New England ideal of the self-sufficient Republican, small r Republican farmer. And this is the first woodcut. In reality, farms were not always so prosperous or successful in the early 1800s. Historians have usually called them self-sufficient or sometimes yeoman farms. Most were small and run on the labor of family members. This first image shows the abundance of the land with the, the deep forest, the thick forest there, and uh, the lack of labor. We have a man here working on chopping down a tree, a log, and way in the background is his wife. So we have two laborers to clear this land and turn it into a cultivated forest from the wilderness. 
There are only the farmer and his wife as workers. Unless a farmer came with substantial resources, he produced at a subsistence level, especially in the beginning. Now those with substantial resources would be those uh, particularly that Williamson personally recruited, uh, the Roses, the Nicholases, uh, the Wadsworths and Geneseo came with substantial resources. These were people who could employ laborers to do the clearing and to move their farms, very substantial sized farms along very quickly. The vast majority of settlers to the region were much smaller uh, family groups, perhaps a husband and wife, uh, more likely maybe a man and sons or a group of brothers, somehow uh, extended family connected, were often involved in moving together to provide the additional labor. He usually produced at a subsistence level, especially in the beginning. Most farmers lacked the capital, labor, or knowledge to produce a surplus for markets. Prior to the Erie Canal's completion in 1825, transporting agricultural goods to large markets on the eastern seaboard was extremely difficult and costly. Depending on where the farmer was, most goods had to travel by water and land to Albany in New York City or south to Baltimore. It was Geneva's location at the foot of Seneca Lake and on the Seneca River that made it a nexus for trade in those early years. And of course that continued throughout the 19th century. And this is a, a drawing from 1807 showing Geneva. I'm, I believe, I haven't double checked it, but I believe this is a view looking uh, from around um, Exchange Street area that this week, these were houses on Exchange Street, although it was done by an amateur high, um, artist, the Baroness uh, Hyde de Neuville, if I've got her name correctly, she was, uh, she and her husband were exiles from France under Napoleon, and she apparently traveled here and a number of other places, and this was a sketch that she did of Geneva, so this is, I believe, the earliest image of the community, so 1807, we do already have a number of houses, there's no sign in this particular sketch that I can see of ships, but they were probably coming into the harbor over here behind the houses. In general, farmers in the early days used inefficient practices because they lacked the labor and technology to be more productive. They planted around stumps without plowing. And it's a little hard to tell, but this is the second stage in the development of that same farm. We have uh, the man and probably a neighbor, perhaps a relative, planting crops in a field that is still filled with stumps. Uh, all of these trees until the invention of stump pullers, which was around 1810, had to be removed by one person with an ax or hatchet um, or a saw. And I'm not entirely sure about the invention of, of uh, crosscut saws. I think it was quite a bit later. So it was extremely difficult. And as stumps would have been very difficult to remove, they just left them in place and planted around them uh, at the very beginning. We still have our farm wife here. She has a baby now. And we have uh, the animals, the piglets, the um, cows here or oxen. Honestly, it's a little hard to tell in the, the woodcut that those were the two, those were among the livestock as we'll see that were most likely to have been a part of the very early farms. They planted around stumps without plowing, grew crops among weeds and exhausted the soil rather than amending it. They used the soil and livestock at hand and did not work to improve them for conditions or to increase production. As seen in these woodcuts, the first crop available to the settler was wood. Many trees had to be cleared to plant farm crops. Some wood went to building a shelter and fences to protect livestock. Also, it was one of the items a farmer could get cash for. And these are some of the advertisements that, that uh, you can see from the Geneva newspapers. If he burned the wood, he could sell the resulting ash at the nearest market for cash or goods. The potash produced from it was a valuable chemical used in making soap, gunpowder, glass, and other goods. Wood was so abundant that its greatest value was as ash. And these were just a few. The, these are from 1806, which is the earliest period that we have uh, newspapers for Geneva that are available on the internet. So you can look these up yourself through the Rochester Regional Library uh, Council. But we can see ashes. The subscriber will pay cash for good ashes delivered at his pot and pearl ash works at the old castle near Geneva. And that was Samuel Warner, who was here in town for many years afterwards. Uh, grain will be received of those indebted to the subscriber if delivered by the 15th of January next. Those who remain indebted to him after that can, will be called upon in the name of the people. So debt 
collection was always a concern for those who were dealing um, as shopkeepers, tradesmen, and also kind of a de facto bank because banking was more or less non-existent at this point. And then we have um, this business here and I've cut the top off and I don't recall which business it was, but we can see that this one not only is interested in ash, pearl ash and pot ash, cash will be paid for those and cash was in short supply. So that was one way that a farmer could get cash, hard money, uh, particularly for something like paying his taxes when uh, they had land taxes to pay. But for other things, wheat, rye, corn, oats, beeswax, butter, and cheese will be taken in payment. So again, other things that farmers at this point are producing. <clears throat> if farmers were able to bring livestock with them, it was usually the oxen and pigs seen in the woodcuts. Pigs could forage in the forest until the time for slaughter, saving the farmer the difficulty of, pay of feeding them. They would also consume various waste products on the farm, like apples, potatoes, skim milk, whey, and buttermilk. Slow but strong, oxen were the best draft animals for the rough roads and stump-ridden fields of early farms. A cow would be an important addition to the farm if the family could afford it. Once enough land was cleared, grain crops were planted, often among the tree stumps, as I mentioned. Wheat, corn, and grasses for hay were the main crops grown for the new settler. Um, I'm sorry, uh, were the main crops grown in New York in the early 1800s. Corn was the most important crop for the new settler. Cornmeal, hominy, and salt pork were the primary diet for the farm family. Corn was too common a crop to be worth transporting to market, but distilling it into whiskey or using it to fatten swine made it more valuable. Whiskey could be sold locally, or it might pay back the investment of shipping it to a bigger market. Pigs could be driven to market and sold for cash or goods. Wheat was usually grown as a cash crop if the farmer had access to a market to sell it at. As a farm became established, and we're looking at a slightly more established farm in this woodcut, the family might grow oats, barley, and buckwheat. Oats were usually to feed animals and buckwheat was commonly consumed by the family. Barley could be eaten or fed to livestock. Later in the 1800s, as Germans immigrated to Western New York, it would be used largely for brewing. Other products a farm family could produce for cash were maple sugar, butter, and cheese, and flax for linen or seed oil. Apple trees were planted for cider. There was little other fruit production at this early period, except for family consumption or sometimes to produce brandy. Hunting, trapping, and fishing were also sources of food and income on early farms, at least until enough settlement had occurred that uh, hunting and trapping were less likely to be productive. And then this is our third view of the farm in this evolution. Um, the third stage shows a farmer who has conquered most of the wilderness. We have a fair bit of forest still here, but wide open areas throughout the farm property, a nice, uh, orchard here as well. Neatness and order prevails. The farmer has conquered most of the wilderness. He has a frame house with a picket fence, an orchard is planted for cider, and a wagon of hay right here is going to market. With success, including better roads and markets, a farmer might invest in sheep, geese, chickens, and horses. Farmers throughout the state and the Northeast with this level of success might think about ways to better their farm but they faced numerous challenges. One was the continued shortage of labor. Farm work was as ever hard and unrelenting. Many young men and women wanted to leave the farm. Even as Western New York grew and developed, people continued moving West. Others went to the growing cities in the Northeast and after the Erie Canal opened along that corridor. Farmers complained that the immigrant laborers from England and Ireland were too specialized in their knowledge to adapt to the wide variety of tasks required in the states. Apparently, because of the higher population in England and Ireland, uh, they had a lot of farm laborers, and so they would specialize in very particular things. And at least uh, according to some of the sources I looked at, American farmers would complain they'd hire these people and they couldn't do enough tasks. An American farmer needed to be able to do almost anything that would be done on the farm. Now, uh, once we get to this point, and I'm looking at farming through about 1840, because uh, the earliest uh, substantial uh, 
historians of agriculture in this area sort of pick 1840 as a cutoff point. Now, of course, all of these changes happen gradually and vary according to time and place. Things that were um, early settlement agriculture here around uh, Geneva would have been the 1790s, 1810s to eh, 1820. Then things start to change. Um, but as you go to Ohio and the old Northwest region along the upper Mississippi, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, you're looking at a slightly uh, later date for some of these developments. But here, of course, the major change is the opening of the Erie Canal and, of course, Geneva's connection through the Seneca Cayuga Canal and the many other canals that were built after that. The canal was started in 1817, was completed in uh, 1825 through to Buffalo. And you can see in this image here, this is the Seneca Cayuga connection to Geneva. This is Geneva in 1836. And although I had to really shrink it down to fit it into the PowerPoint, you can see buildings all along the lakeshore. And most of these from our understanding were warehouses. This is where the farm products went before getting on a packet boat to travel on the canal or a steamship to go down to Watkins Glen and potentially the southern route. Um, when Williamson came here in, I believe it was 1791, he came up from Williams, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He went by water from Baltimore to Williamsport and then had to travel overland. Uh, I just went to Virginia on Route 15 and the various uh, highways over the Christmas break and looking at the map realized that what took us a couple of hours to travel in 2022 uh, took him, I think it was six or so weeks just to get from Williamsport to about the location of Bath, which was one of the communities that he established. So obviously substantially different types of travel times. That southern route did continue, particularly for Geneva because of the navigability of Seneca Lake, but the canal really altered um, options for farmers. There were places to sell goods. Um, very early on, you could only sell it to your immediate neighbors, maybe take things overland at really great expense. So it had to be worth it. Something like whiskey might have been worth it. Um, so it would have been very difficult to transport your goods. The markets expand and at the same time, we have shifts in the way farmers start to think about consumption. Um, this sort of self-sufficient, sustainable farmer ideal, which was common in the 18th and early 19th century, it sort of went along with being an American. And we still have that trend today, this idea of going back to the land, living off the grid, I'm gonna take care of all my needs. Uh, it is a trend that goes back this far and farmers were reluctant to a certain degree. Farmers do tend to be conservative um, in general and they were reluctant at that time to take a chance on markets. Many of them had had bad experience with businesses with uh, the cash system, the credit system, um, the whole financial system was unregulated and unpredictable. There were crashes and market booms and busts pretty regularly and many farmers were understandably suspicious of the market and their place in it. But you did have a gradual inclination both to have more consumable goods, uh, china, glass, candles, uh, education, and various other types of things that could make your life more comfortable and better and that better for your children, with also the ability to sell things that you are producing off of your farm. But that did require increasing your efficiency to produce a surplus. Um, the uh, other problem was the continued shortage of labor. The farmer might want to sell more, might want to produce more, but didn't have the people to do the hard labor, uh, which very early on in this period requires actually hoeing all the weeds out by hand, planting, maybe you'd use a plow to do your furrow, but actually planting the seed either by scattering it and hoping a large percentage of it comes up, you're not doing much except hoeing to get rid of weeds. So there's a lot of competition between your plants that you want to grow and all the plants that you don't want to grow, the weeds. Um, farm work uh, was very hard. It was unrelenting. And a lot of young men and women wanted to leave the farm. As Western New York grew, people went to the cities. Um, if they didn't want to continue farming, they had the option for cash money, working in a factory, uh, working in larger cities. And once we have the canal opening, you can see cities like Rochester start growing and sucking more of the population in that direction. You didn't need to move west and start a farm. You could move west and get a job in the city and make your, your money that way. So the market starts to expand. The opportunities for farmers start to expand 
but it is difficult for them to take advantage of them because of labor shortages. And also because they, they didn't have the knowledge about how to farm more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> markets were transformed, but market, but farmers really also had to find their way into this. Um, for example, there is a story that John Johnston tells, and I'll get to him uh, briefly in a minute. Johnston writes in one of the farmers' magazines about an issue with uh, what he called chess. I believe it is today a weed called pigeon weed. And there was a debate among farmers, and these were intelligent men uh, who farmed for a living, and they were debating whether or not chess spontaneously appeared when you planted, I think it was wheat, I can't remember the details of the conversation, but there was a real belief that uh, if you planted a certain I think, a plant, wheat, I believe, you would get chess weeds. It was just spontaneously happening due to certain environmental conditions. And so Johnson actually did a test and he tested out the different conditions and he came to the conclusion that no, it wasn't spontaneous. It meant your, your seed was dirty. Um, they did have difficulty cleaning out seed, making sure that they didn't have weed seeds in with their grain seeds or their grass seeds. Um, a lot of difficulties that farmers faced, some were willing to make those changes and able to make them, uh, others were not. And as you can see here from this slide, agricultural products prices eventually did start to go up. They, they varied quite a bit in the early part of um, this period from 1800 to 1840. Manufactured goods, which were very expensive, at say 1800, 1810, once the factory system was developed, started to fall. And farmers, as a consequence, did start to be to sell more to market and become more prosperous. They became more comfortable with consumption of consumer goods and started to invest in other enterprises. So this is again happening gradually and it depends on who you're talking about as well. One of the things that made a difference was technology and innovation. This is where we get to innovators like John Johnston, also George Forden, who was another local man who was very um, interested in tile drainage and experimental with it. The Finger Lakes inventors included Jethro Wood and Thomas Burrell, and they um, innovated to try and improve machinery. They couldn't find the laborers they needed to do things, so they would develop machinery that would help ease the burden for them. Uh, Jethro Wood, I believe, is the one who first patented a plow with a um, iron uh, share that goes into the ground. And some farmers didn't want to use it because they thought that iron produced weeds. Well that it was a logical conclusion because if you used a plow, an iron plow, it did a better job of breaking up the soil. It allowed all seeds planted in it to grow better. That would include weed seeds because they would have had weed seeds in both the seed they were spreading and in the ground. Uh, it had nothing to do with the metal itself, but simply the improved ability to plow the land. And then you needed to get better control of your seed distribution and the presence of seeds in the soil. Um, and my slides, also uh, forgot about this one, agricultural education. So farmers don't know these things. There's no science of farming in existence at this point. They're guessing, well, if I put the seed in the ground, this happens and why does it happen? It's all based on anecdote and observation, which can take you a certain distance. But as we know today, it's data collection, experimentation and scientific uh, hypothesis and testing that tell you whether or not something works. They didn't even know how a seed grew from a seed to a plant. It was really something that was as yet unknown and really didn't start to change until a real push for agricultural education happened. And it started with agricultural societies, usually statewide, and there was a New York State Agricultural Society, and publications, which were aimed, as the cultivator put it, to improve the soil and the mind. And this is just two of the ones that were locally available. And a lot of John Johnston's writing was captured in these uh, periodicals. So then we get to Watson's millennial state, um, sort of the, the ultimate uh, epitome of what an American farm would look like. And so here we have our um, sort of a Greek revival farmhouse here. Uh, we've got our sleigh because it's winter time. All the fences now are nicely constructed and not those zigzag or rook fences that we saw at the beginning. Our one sole tree left from the primordial forest is here. We have barns, we have a variety of animals and all of these um, crops laid out or the wintered fields uh, laid out in squares so that you can see it's very orderly. The wildness is gone. We are now at the point where um, 
America should be in terms of its agriculture. But to get here, they really did have to make some changes. And one of those changes was brought about by John Johnston, who was something of an apostle of tile drainage, the system of uh, draining water from the subsoil. And I'm not going to go on too much about him because we've got lots of resources on our website about him. But he really was willing to look at things differently. And this was spreading among many farmers, but it was a slow slog. The earliest innovators were men like Jefferson and Washington, landed plantation owners who had the time to sort of sit around and figure out, oh, the science of farming. Uh, for a practical farmer, and there was a real division between book farmers and practical farmers for a while that sort of subsided towards mid-century as practical farmers like John Johnston adopted some of the uh, attempts to improve the soil, improve their culture of the land, and started to spread their ideas. And someone like Johnston had a little bit more credibility with your average farmer than someone um, who was landed gentry and doing this as a hobby. And this is just some images that show the principles of tile drainage and farmers uh, preparing the soil and putting the drains down to help get the subsurface off. And Johnston talked about a lot about how his yields were increased by removing the water, by adding manure, and everyone knew manure helped fields uh, produce better crops. The problem was spreading it around the field was a labor intensive job. So most times early farmers did not have the ability to do that. They couldn't do it all themselves and they didn't have the labor to do that much of it, um, to pay anyone to do it because they didn't have access to credit. There was not, um, we did start to see farmers banks established. Uh, William Strong, who built Rose Hill, was involved with the Farmers Bank of Geneva. And that was an effort to help farmers find a way to purchase what they needed at the beginning of the season in order to produce a crop and, and make a profit at the end and then pay the loan back, ideally, of course. And then just a quick timeline to give you an idea of how after 1840, changes in uh, technology, changes in the way that farmers approached farming, increased their productivity and decreased the time. So we're looking from 1830, sort of towards the end of this period I'm, I'm talking about, it took 250 to 300 labor hours to produce 100 bushels of wheat. Whereas by even 1890, that had dropped to 40 to 50 labor hours. And of course, by 1987, with the types of technology you had in the late 20th century, we're looking at three labor hours. So that constant reduction, which is why we are now able to have uh, so this graph from much later in the 1940s shows the land in farms plummeted even, of course, it's much lower now, uh, while the production of those farms just skyrocketed because as sort of the next piece of the story would be how farmers took advantage of innovation and changes to improve their productivity and get by with fewer laborers. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if we have any questions from anyone. Checking for understanding as you do with your students at school. <laughs> And we could go, um, I should mention also, as I said, this is really looking at the period from about 1790 when Williamson first came here. And the very earliest people to come here were probably hunters and trappers. Um, go back far enough, we've got Jesuit missionaries in some parts of the Genesee country. Um, but we're looking at the period in which it finally became safe and stable for people to start farms here. Then we start to see around 1840 that change to more of a productive agriculture in this area. Those who really wanted to just carve out the um, wilderness, they kept moving west. Any evidence early settlers observed or learned from Native American agricultural practices? Um, I would say probably yes, but I didn't come across anything specific other than some travelers coming through talking about Native American culture. Um, that is not something I know a great deal about. I think there was really a disconnect between the white Anglo settlers, for the most part, that's who the earliest ones were, and the Haudenosaunee. They just didn't see them as farmers in the sense that they thought of farming. Um, in fact, I do believe 
I read one account that talked about, well, they're planting their corn and they put all these beans and squash around it. Like there was, that was a stupid thing to do when it's a completely sensible thing to do to control weeds and provide the, the nutrition for the corn. But whoever wrote this, and I can't recall which uh, account I read it in, completely did not understand that. And again, like I said, they didn't have an understanding of the science of plant culture. But that's a great question. Um, this is great. Was there much trade in seeds and knowledge with the Iroquois farmers? So I don't know. Maybe John's got it in his presentation, which I haven't had a chance to watch. Uh, what vegetables were important for home consumption? From what I was able to find out, um, they did get meat very early. Um, I found most of the accounts talking about the native peoples were from that first 10 to 15 years. So I suspect, and I'd need to look at the timeline for the loss of land and the reduction of the Native American reservations to see if there was more effort to confine the Native peoples to specific places, which may be the case. I do not know enough about that. Um, they were trading, they were coming, the Native peoples were coming into uh, communities like Geneva to purchase things and to trade things. I don't know if seeds would have been those things. That is an, a great question. I'm not sure where I would track that down. It would probably take trolling through a lot of accounts of early visitors. Um, so I'm not sure about that. And then vegetables for home consumption, uh, probably potatoes. Uh, they were grown here, but not really as a market commodity until communities got large enough for people to want to buy potatoes. Obviously in Geneva, there would have been people purchasing them, but potatoes would not have been worth transporting. Uh, to New York City until the uh, roads got uh, the roads and the canals got fast enough for the potatoes to get there before they rotted. Um, the, the the main interest was really wheat, wheat, wheat. Uh, with corn as secondary, and corn usually as secondary for uh, livestock, because I think perhaps even similar to today, the biggest farms and the biggest profits are to be made from grain cultivation and meat cultivation. Uh, we do not, and at least from what I hear in the news reports, and that's my only source of information on it, the uh, ability for farmers to really take advantage of federal programs and uh, produce um, produce, uh, some of the things we produce around here, uh, strawberries and blueberries, the fruit cultivation was not very common until much later in the 19th century when the markets for people not buying, not producing their own food got much larger as you had cities like Rochester and New York grow and you had a lot of people living there. They didn't have cows in the streets anymore, the pigs in the streets by the 1850s, 60s, they need to purchase food. So that would be kind of the, the alteration. It would depend also on where you are. Um, why was the first known established community village? Oh, where was, where was, why? I'm not quite sure if I've understood how that uh, question is phrased. Um, the first established community, well, it depends on what you mean by a community. Geneva was around by the 1780s, but it was little more than three or four huts along an Indian trail. I'm not sure the date for Canandaigua. Utica uh, was one of the earliest because it was a fort prior to being the community that it is today. Um, I'm not sure if that's Fort Stanwix. I've forgotten. I just read it yesterday and it's already dropped out of my mind. So some of them were uh, based around old trading forts. Um, of course, Fort Niagara was still present with the British occupying it until a couple decades into the 19th century. So um, I would say Geneva is one of the earliest, certainly all along the top of the uh, lakes, would be the north ends of the lakes would be the oldest settlements, whereas Rochester was a village in 1812 and Geneva had already been around for 20 years. So you really do have that development shift once the canal comes through that moves things to the north. Did Geneva organize a public market? Well, that's a good question. And I have absolutely no idea about the answer to that question. I would guess, yes, that there would be markets going on here. The challenge about getting sort of information about ordinary stuff is you have to look at the newspaper or you have to be fortunate enough to have somebody write about coming here. And we do have some people who wrote, um, who traveled through the area and wrote about it. And their information was sometimes helpful, but it wasn't all encompassing. 
as a traveler who maybe just spent one night in a tavern. Um, and the newspapers were filled with national news. And then there was sort of lots and lots of ads and you have to read between the eyes because there wasn't much in the 1810s, 1820s, which we do have some newspapers for. There wasn't a lot of conversation about the local community, probably because everybody knew what was going on. <laughs> they, they all walked out their, their door and got the news that way. Whereas the newspaper was a way to find out what was going on elsewhere in the state and in the country and in the world. Um, that makes it a challenge for the researcher. Uh, so if that's a good question. If I find out sometime, perhaps I'll write a blog post about it. <laughs> I don't know if we have any more questions. That looks like that's all of them. Well, we are moving up on almost an hour and, and we're trying to shorten these down because, but you have some good questions and I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much for attending.